Welcome everyone to the next Gen 4 International Forum webinar presentation. Today's presentation on the performance assessments for fuels and materials for advanced nuclear reactors will be presented by Professor Daniel Labrier. He's with Idaho State University. Before we get started, there's a couple of housekeeping things um, that I'd like to take a few minutes to, to go through quickly. The audio is broadcast over your computer speakers, so please select the mic and ra speakers radio button on the right-hand audio pane and display to make adjustments. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, please contact the GoToWebinar help desk at the number shown there to ask a question. Select the questions pane on your screen and type in your question. We'll take questions at the end following the presentation as time will allow. Today's uh, recording, today's presentation is being recorded, so please feel free to watch it again or share it with others. It'll be posted uh, with the slide deck at the Gen4 uh, website at www.gen-4.org. The slide deck is also available as a PDF for your download today at your workstation, along with a handout of the GIF presentations that have been presented in the past and a look at a few of the upcoming ones. Last and certainly not least, please take a few minutes to answer the survey at SurveyMonkey at the link shown there or at the QR code that's accessible for mobile devices if you're attending um, in that fashion. Again, the questions will be at the end of the presentation, but uh, to access the question pane, you should have a an orange rectangle with a white arrow. And if you click that, it'll expand into a dialogue box where you can type your question um, and we will go through those again at the end. Doing today's introduction is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the group leader of the Radiological Materials Group at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the chair of the Gen4 International Forum Education and Training Work Group. Patricia. Thank you, Berta. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure today to have Dr. Daniel Labrier with us. Uh, I hope everybody is safe uh, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. So Dr. Labrier is an assistant professor of nuclear engineering at Idaho State University. He earned his doctorate in nuclear science and engineering from ISU in 2013, with an emphasis in irradiated materials characterization. His research focuses on characterizing nuclear grade materials that are exposed to extreme environments and nuclear reactor safety projects, including investigation of corrosion and erosion of structural materials relevant to light water reactors and advanced uh, reactor systems such as sodium fast reactor, molten salt reactor, high temperature gas gasco reactor. His research interests include development and qualifications of fuels and materials for advanced reactor concepts, investigating thermal hydraulic effects on material performance and used fuel recycling techniques. After serving as a postdoctorate fellow at the University of New Mexico and as a research professor at Oregon State University, Dr. Labrier returned to ISU in March 2019 and maintains a residence as a researcher at the Case Building at the Center of Advanced Energy Studies in Idaho Falls, Idaho. So I'm going to hand it over to Daniel now. Thank you again, Daniel, for volunteering uh, to give this presentation. Uh, of course, Patricia, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. And Berta, thank you very much for the work that you've done to, uh, to set everything up so that we run smoothly. Um, so the first thing that I want to mention is that I am, while I have a, a slew of partnerships that I'm very proud of, uh, both at the university, uh, industrial and national lab, uh, levels, I, the views that I'm presenting are solely my own, um, and so I am not here to put forth a particular reactor technology, uh, nor a particular pathway to deployment. Um, I'm not necessarily being uh, supported by any particular entity in giving this presentation. As, as Patricia mentioned, this was a volunteer basis, and I 
I took this as an opportunity to, to really try and do something to help further our, our field and our industry as a whole. Uh, and I'm not being supported financially by any particular entity in order to provide this talk. This is solely of my own doing. So, um, really what I wanted to spend some time uh, to, to chat with everyone today uh, about is talking about, uh, as the title suggests, uh, performance assessments for uh, different fuels and materials for advanced nuclear reactors. Um, and so as a part of that, we'll, we'll take a few minutes to discuss the, the different uh, pathways that are being investigated. Uh, but particularly, we, we all will look at ending up at the same place, which is qualification of materials, which then leads us to the, the point of being able to uh, construct and then eventually test and, and deploy uh, advanced reactors. And that, that's our goal in, in trying to develop these, these techniques. Um, so just to mention that there are a, a host of, of novel material concepts that are being investigated as part of Gen 4 reactor development. Um, however, many of these candidates are not necessarily new, even though they are novel. Um, they are rooted in historical programs that go back as far as the 1950s in the United States, at least. Uh, I think that's pretty internationally uh, the case as well. Um, but the idea is that there have been uh, starts and stops for uh, a variety of different reactor uh, types and the campaigns that led them. Um, and so much of what we'll talk about today, as far as the technology goes, has been around for quite some time, even though, of course, there have been advances due to um, different technological and scientific advances, uh, such as the idea of being able to use a printer to uh, print a piece of reactor core, as was just demonstrated at Oak Ridge National Lab for their, uh, for their TCR project. Um, that's something that couldn't have been really even imagined going as far back as 20 years ago. Um, and so the technologies are, are almost beyond keeping pace with, but what's most important, in my opinion, is the idea that somehow we all have to end up at the same place. And that's at the, uh, the ability to be able to qualify these materials. And so that's what I'd like to spend a, a good portion of my talk today talking about. Um, most of what's required to, to come down to that is uh, the data that's needed to lead to material down selection, uh, studies that determine whether uh, use of a particular material is feasible, and as I just mentioned, the eventual qualification. Um, that's something that's incredibly costly, uh, both in time and money. Um, as I'll discuss a little bit later, and this is something that's probably not new to most folks in the industry, is that you're usually looking on the order of 20 years worth of work to be able to qualify, say, a new fuel concept. Um, and so the idea that I want to at least dive in uh, a little bit deeper to is the discussion of an all of the above strategy. And I realize that's a bit of a buzz phrase, and I'll, I'll discuss that <laughs> in a little more detail later. Uh, but with such a variety of different reactor topics and a variety of materials that go into each one of those different topics, we as an industry really have to try and find a way to streamline the process and the strategies that we use in order to be able to take these concepts from the drawing room all the way to qualification. And so that moreover is what I'd like to discuss today, uh, is the idea of being able to advance many of these candidates, material candidates from the concept all the way to deployment. So as I mentioned, there are a variety of technologies as far as uh, reactor types are concerned, and each one of them have uh, some can be similar, some can be wildly different. Uh, when it comes to their components, uh, all the way from the core out through the uh, production of electricity, there are so many different combinations that are possible. Um, 
But when all is said and done, as I've mentioned now probably a couple of times, and we'll mention a couple of times more, um, we all need to end up at the same place, which is being able to justify the use of these materials to a regulatory body uh, here in the U.S. that would be the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be able to advance uh, these reactors into the deployment stage. Um, and so because of that, we need to come up with a particular pathway that allows us to be able to look at design concepts, to be able to um, select, carefully select and with purpose select the materials that we use. Um, the variety of heat exchange systems that, that can be utilized for uh, heat removal and then eventually delivery of the power. And then of course the working fluids. Um, you could set up, say for instance, um, you could take one particular fuel form, the, the tricer particle. Um, it's been investigated for several decades for use in high temperature gas reactors. Um, but now in the past decade or so, it's also being investigated as part of a campaign for developing what's called, say, the, the fluoride high temperature uh, reactor, which actually is a molten salt concept um, that traditionally used a molten fuel. Um, and now it's using a solid fuel. Well, based on the working fluid that you have, the fuel could behave in very different ways. The heat transfer could behave in very different ways. And so being able to say that I have a molten salt reactor or I have a high temperature reactor or I'm using tricer fuel, it really depends on what your combination is. And as we start to delve more into the uh, modular capabilities of our, our fleet that we want to develop, um, there are a lot of options for choice, which can be a very good thing. However, as many of you know, whenever you go to the grocery store and you see that you want to get a uh, type of tomato, canned tomato that's on the shelf, and there are 15 different brands, um, trying to choose the, the one that is best for you um, is going to depend on a lot of different things. And the, the type of choices that you have here uh, cost, time to market, um, the ability to be able to test and qualify um, background information, facilities that you would need to utilize to do your testing. These are all components of uh, consideration for going to uh, driving us towards qualification. So that said, every entity, whether that's a, a lab or industrial partner or university or some conglomeration thereof, um, they will go through their own scrutinization of their, their system process. Um, and so it's something that we it's it's something that we all have to do. We will all have to participate in in some way, shape, or form. Um, regardless of the technology, regardless of the design, regardless of that, 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 whatever you want to insert there, um, we'll all be in the same place. And so trying to devise a proper strategy that will um, kind of allow us all to collaborate, even if we're working in parallel and many times in competition, um, will allow us to kind of get to the goal line uh, in, in a similar fashion. So the qualification process, I, I really do like this uh, graphic that was uh, developed uh, by a couple of colleagues, uh, Steve Hayes and Mitch Meyer at, at INL in, in one of the papers they published oh, probably 10, 12 years ago. Um, really kind of gives you the idea that there are so many different aspects um, to the, the qualification process. Now, in this particular gimmick, if you look at it going clockwise from the top, uh, you take a particular design, um, you prepare the feedstock and start doing the characterization, you start doing the fabrication, uh, fuel characterization. As you continue around the cycle, these are all aspects, at least for fuel development, of, of the process that will need to be done in order to um, sort of vet or qualify any of the materials that we're planning on using. Um, they'll have to go through radiation testing or some sort of, um, whether that's neutron irradiation or whether we can justify the use of ion irradiation uh, in similar techniques. 
uh, we'll have to go through some set of accident scenario analysis, um, whether that's through thermal, neutronic, um, and typically some combination thereof. And then the examination of materials both prior to and after your testing, um, whether that's through radiation testing in a reactor, whether that's through transient testing. Uh, eventually you end up at what looks to be about the 10 o'clock hour on your, on your dial there at performance assessment. And that's kind of a nebulous term. And I realize that is also part of the, the title of this talk. What exactly is meant by performance assessment? Um, you can have assessment relative to a particular metric, um, how it performs in a particular temperature range, per se, or whether it's suitable up to particular pressures, um, and what is considered suitable. Um, is it something where you have materials that um, have changes in the bulk properties um, that are very noticeable? or something that maybe changes on the microstructural level that isn't as easy to assess in a bulk property. And so we not only have to look at um, particular materials, we have to look at different scales and how the effects that something that might happen at the nano or micro scale can and will affect materials on the bulk property scale. Um, and this needs to be considered, um, and of course, the I, one thing I have left out, and I, I shouldn't at all, uh, is that modeling simulation plays a significant role in helping to supplement the testing that needs to be done. And, and supplement maybe isn't the right word to use, but it is a complementary piece um, in that you could use modeling simulation to help develop your material um, through, see, uh, uh, like DFT for being able to go from first principle alloys and, and sort of dope them with different materials um, in, in different places within the uh, structural, uh, the, the structure of the, the material and, and see how that changes the properties. That can be much more efficiently done on the model and simulation scale, but eventually you have to go through the physical testing. Um, and then there's sort of a back and forth, a, a synergistic, of uh, relationship between the two as you go through this process, which is also why it's it's very fitting that this is in the form of a cycle, because you will typically go through multiple cycles just looking at a single material for a single purpose. Um, now you can start to see that through all these processes, this is where the time and expense starts to really add up. And considering that we need to consider this for not just core components uh, within the reactor itself, uh, but structural materials, uh, as I mentioned, the heat removal and heat exchange systems, the safety systems uh, that go into advanced reactor design. Um, these are all things that have to be considered as, as part of um, this process to be able to go from the concept to the deployment. So as I mentioned, modeling simulation, uh, while very useful, um, can only go so far. Um, while the techniques and the computational power is, is growing vastly by the day, um, many times the models that are input into a particular system are only as good as the data from which those models were derived. Um, and so well-vetted experimental data is crucial um, to the qualification process and to being successful at it. Um, and again, it comes down to what would you consider as success? Does that mean reducing the amount of time? Does this mean uh, reduced capital costs? Does this mean um, being able to vet a particular material and have it be used for multiple platforms? Um, you know, there, there are different ways to, to define what success may be. Uh, but the idea being is that there has to be some relationship between uh, actually uh, acquiring the experimental data at each point along the process. So one of the limiting factors for the qualification process um, most often it comes down to the testing capabilities. As I mentioned, the computational resources are actually starting to, to ramp up significantly. Um, and while they, they um, of course, have their limitations, um, 
their actions are going to become more plentiful. And that's a good thing. Um, however, the testing capabilities, the experimental testing capabilities, um, are currently stretched pretty thin um, for the, the data that is needed for the qualification process. Um, if you want to think of it as kind of a bottleneck in, in the system, um, when you've got materials that are going to be part of the, the core or the structure uh, within your reactor system, um, you're going to have to go through a, a set of safety tests, um, you know, think of thermal cycling or uh, high pressure inlets or, or something along those lines. Um, you need to consider radiation testing and uh, you need to consider transient testing. You know, the, looking at essentially steady state day-to-day uh, -day ops and the effects that could be um, related to both thermomechanical properties and the irradiation of materials and then start to consider what happens during an accident scenario. And again, these are not new concepts as far as qualification of materials goes, but it is something that can hold us back as far as a time frame goes and as far as a cost goes. Because the facilities that we have for those particular sets of data that we need for qualification are are limited. Uh, the pathways for qualification also include the need for quality assured work. And this is something that isn't discussed nearly as often as probably should be. Um, there's a difference between setting up a, a well-designed uh, experiment and being able to acquire the data that is going to be eventually needed for qualification but if you don't have some sort of quality assurance plan in place, um, that will limit the ability for vendors to be able to do testing. Um, if you can't back up where you got your data or how you prepared your data, uh, essentially handing someone over a, a, a blueprint of how they could do the same thing uh, and nominally get the same data as you or in the, in the same ballpark at least, um, then the questions are going to come, particularly when it comes to regulation, which is, well, how good is your data? Um, what processes did you go through? How, how can we um, allow a vendor to go forth with a full design deployment if the data structure of which their um, design structure is built um, really doesn't um, hold up to regulatory standards. And as I mentioned, uh, actually a couple of slides ago, I guess that, that this is a cyclic event and that you're going to go through this cycle uh, several times. Uh, testing and development of materials is an iterative process. And when you're looking at developing materials for new applications, um, you're looking at new materials itself, uh, whether they're uh, different alloys or alloys are being tested in new environments. Um, with limited testing capabilities, now you're looking at a very expensive endeavor um, in terms of money, in terms of time, and in terms of resources. And in many cases, these are shared resources that multiple entities are trying to access. Um, if you happen to be fortunate and you know, say you work for a, a company that has a, a university partner that has a research reactor. Well, maybe there are some preliminary tests that could be done there, but eventually you're going to have to go to a, a full-scale radiation test facility or say to a transient testing facility. Um, and every other vendor that has made it to that point is going to be looking to do the same thing. Um, for vetting their own materials. And, and so this is where the, the idea of bottlenecking kind of starts to come in. Um, so you're either on the wait list or uh, the money you're putting forth to design your test. Um, it can just be very taxing. And so what we'd like to discuss is a little bit of a strategy on how you can um, move through that process a little more smoothly. So a little bit of historical background. Um, I mentioned this number already. Um, for the process of fuel and material development, um, and this is actually came from a, a paper uh, not quite 15 years ago from uh, a couple of colleagues at uh, INL um, 
that discuss the, the pathways that you go through for uh, material development. So you're looking at uh, selection of potential candidates, um, the, the lab scale development, then scaling up. In other words, being able to take your testing again from design to small scale, moving up to uh, something that's beyond the bank scale to a, uh, I dare use the word prototype or something along those lines. Uh, and then towards the qualification of particular materials or designs that go into your development, and then eventually on a demonstration. Um, for a scheduling for new fuels and for some materials, you're looking on the order of 20 to 25 years. Um, if you were to look historically at some of the work that was done in the 1950s and 1960s for reactor development, you'll see that those numbers are much, much smaller, but then again, there's a very different time uh, throughout the world, and that's just the world we live in right now, is, is the, the time scale is, is much more extended than it used to be. Um, for some reasons, good, and for some reasons, maybe that could be questioned. Um, as a recent example, um, I, I bring up one that was actually just in the news very recently, uh, Alloy 617, uh, that was added to the, the BNB code uh, just actually earlier this month. Um, qualification, though, took 12 years and about a $15 million investment from the Department of Energy. Um, so, and, and again, this is for structural. Um, but it still had to go through the same sort of vetting process that many other materials have to go through. Um, but still, it's even a lesser seal than you might have for a, a candidate fuel uh, for your particular reactor design. And this was the uh, the first um, the first addition to the boiler and uh, pressure vessel code in 30 years, um, which sort of demonstrates that either for your own reactor development, your own pet design, whatever it may be, um, you're either going to be trying to um, leverage the use of a material that's already been vetted and trying to adapt your design to go to it, or you're going to try and take a newer material, try to vet it and try to qualify it so that you can use that particular material either way um, you're still fighting a bit of a battle when it comes to um, going from the, the design to deployment. Um, now, I realize that uh, everything that I've mentioned so far, uh, a lot of it is either uh, bringing up historical facts or bringing up my own opinion, and, and I want to sort of stress that a little bit. Um, if, as an industry, we, we really want to get to the point of deploying advanced nuclear reactors. Um, in my opinion, we're looking at changes in our paradigm, changes in our thought process, and sort of reimagining uh, or optimizing all possible uses for data. In other words, sort of a, a cross-cutting um, approach where, say, for a material that's being vetted, um, could it be used in multiple reactors or could it be used in multiple places within a particular reactor so that um, the data that you are collecting can be used in multiple venues? Um, and earlier I mentioned the idea of the all of the above strategy. And well, okay, great. That's a soundbite. Um, that's really what it comes down to. What exactly does that mean, though? Um, and so the, the, graphic that's off on the right-hand side of the screen there uh, from USNC, uh, a presentation that they gave out sort of goes from, from the fuel kernel all the way to uh, actually developing a, a graphite fuel block for a reactor. As I mentioned, triso fuel in particular is one that's been studied for one application for 40, 50 years. Um, but other reactor development teams uh, are actually looking at different ways to be able to utilize this process, just using different uh, working fluids or different configurations. Um, and so that's kind of the idea is, is there a way to be able to leverage the qualified data that's already out there, or maybe even data that's leading up to qualifications? So you're not starting from scratch. Um, 
you know, in particular, the, the trice of fuel particles, an interesting one because uh, in many cases, it's the fuel kernel that can vary um, whether it's CO2 or whether it's uranium carbide. Uh, there are discussions of, of other material mixes that could serve as the fuel kernel, but the, the layered structure for containment actually would stay similar or exactly the same as you might see here. And so the idea is, could you look at designs that have a more interchangeable fuel kernel type, knowing that, say, the, the discussion of the, the silicon carbide layers, the pressure boundary, um, versus the interaction of the graphite layers, the, or sorry, the, the pyrolytic carbon layers uh, on the outer structure of the, the triso particle, you might just have to consider their interaction with the particular cooling medium. Um, as opposed to going all the way from the fuel kernel out and having to justify every process of every step along the way. And so that's kind of what I mean by an all the above strategy is that there may be pieces of information that you have to procure for your own particular design, your own concept, but there may be other pieces of information, uh, data that's out there that's already demonstrated a particular use that your design can fit within. So, um, trying to implement an all the above strategy. And again, I'm taking this from an editorial point of view, but informed from a, a variety of, of folks that I've talked to over the years. And the, what's the best, and I'll, I should probably put best in quotes because I'm assessing this is my best. Uh, but how to best approach these challenges. Um, the biggest, in my opinion, the, the most significant challenges that we run into are trying to reduce the hazards that come from uh, irradiation testing, um, reducing your footprint. In other words, are you able to it, you know, try and develop a, a concept that would fit into a warehouse as opposed to a city block. Um, trying to automate some of your processes, uh, both for, I'll say, uh, design and construction, but also for operations. Uh, and then the correlations and the models that are developed to better predict scale up processes. And so this, this graphic that's on here on the right is, is one, it's, it's not actually even from a, a nuclear publication, um, but it came out in, in discussing uh, material performance. And you may recognize several of the, the different portions of this cycle as you might have it. Um, you start up with some uh, particular material, it's going to go through some testing, some physical testing to assess what may have happened, that then is then used to help to significantly add to your model, which then goes back into your design. It also goes into the process to determine the lifetime and the performance of your material that goes along with it. And so this is where the, the experimental data and the modeling and simulation sort of meet up to help develop uh, the data and the justification that's needed for your particular material. Um, being able to speed up that cycle by looking at materials on different scales might actually be a great advantage. Um, so for instance, and I, I discussed this in a little more detail, um, if you have a material that when irradiated actually has uh, some significant uh, radioactive byproducts um, or it retains, uh, say, a neutron activation for, for quite some time, um, you don't, you either have to wait for some of the, uh, the byproducts to decay or you have to um, try and put it through a much more rigorous process for shielding, for analyses. Um, all of these things are which things that could take up time and, and money and your materials uh, and the testing facilities that go along with it. And there's so many things that can be backed up with it. What if you were able to justify looking at properties that uh, describe the bulk performance of a material by looking at the microstructure. 
And again, this is not something that's that's new. Uh, it's recent, but it's not new. Uh, there are researchers internationally that have been considering these ideas for quite some time, but it's it's certainly something that needs to be considered as, as sort of the all of the above strategy is, is looking at um, how you can better and more efficiently assess your performance and doesn't necessarily have to all reside in the bulk property um, performance so long as you have a way to be able to discuss how you get from the microstructural and nano uh, scale up to the bulk property scale and so different ways that we uh, we consider this is through the specific uh, figures of merit that we are interested in whether that's swelling or density, or whether that's um, uh, fatigue, uh, whether it's creep, whether it's uh, the, the strain that's on a particular material. Um, these can vary based on application and material type um, and previous work that's been done. Um, if there's the ability to take advantage of research that was done for vetting a particular alloy in a high temperature environment, even if it wasn't a nuclear application, um, there may be some of those metrics that could be utilized for a nuclear design. Um, for being able to develop new materials, or I'll say novel materials, um, what are the methods that are used to be able to differentiate between um, some of the alloy development? And this is kind of plays along with the, uh, the graphic that's on the right hand side there. If you're able to use modeling and simulation to be able to say, well, if I replace uh, a certain atom in my microstructure at this point, how could that change the behavior and the mechanical and thermomechanical properties of my material? And maybe you can determine very early on without ever having to go to the point of alloy development. Uh, so you could do this through first principle development of DFT that can determine that a material is just not going to work. Uh, it's going to have a failure point. Uh, you're going to have uh, problems at grain boundaries. You're going to have uh, chemical interactions that are adverse to the performance of your material. Those are things that could be assessed without ever having to do uh, an experiment in the lab uh, as far as the performance values goes. And then moving on to performance, uh, looking at uh, multiple venues for when it comes to uh, testing uh, methods and facilities. And, and when, I, when I talk about testing methods, I, I am thinking more from the perspective of microstructural testing versus the macro scale or the bulk property. Um, but again, if, if there's no way to be able to discuss and, and properly assess how you go from the micro scale to the macro scale, then that's something that has to be developed along with it. Uh, and then post-performance assessment. Uh, and again, this ties into the ability to, to look at materials. Uh, maybe you're looking at them in parallel. Uh, maybe you're looking at them on a smaller scale to be able to describe something on a larger scale. Um, maybe this is where you introduce the idea of uh, process automation. Um, for being able to take the place of, uh, particularly for irradiated materials, where you need to have currently, you're, you're looking at very monolithic hot cells and uh, operators that are using manipulators uh, to be able to um, sort of process the analysis of your materials. That's a very costly concept, but it's something, if it is something that could be automated, um, then that might be something to explore to help. Um, reduce cost and, and also to reduce risk, which also is something that isn't discussed as much. Um, I, I've mentioned it maybe once or twice, but I didn't spend much time on it. The, the risk that is concerned for people who are doing the, the, the work for particularly for radiated materials um, is something that also has to be incorporated as, as part of the, the, the strategy is how to reduce those hazards, how to reduce those risks. Um, that can also help speed up time. It can speed up your your, um, your time to market, if you will. Um, 
So let's jump right into testing. Um, because as I mentioned that I, I will say with complete bias, I am an experimentalist. Um, while I appreciate the work that is done by uh, folks in the modeling and simulation world, um, the, the ability to go between those two worlds is a very valuable thing, but you have to be able to have a foot in, in each of them. Um, and so while I value modeling simulation, again, as I mentioned, the, the testing that goes along with it is also a very key thing, especially for, for our industry. Um, so you can look at uh, operational testing, which is something that could be done depending on what material it is you're actually analyzing. Uh, if you're looking at structural material or a particular alloy, maybe you can do furnace tests uh, that don't have to be in pile per se. Um, you can look at setting up a, a high pressure rig to be able to um, try and look at uh, fracture or fatigue for a uh, thermally cycled material. Um, that's not something that necessarily requires an in pile or in reactive test. Uh, but eventually, that's something that you do have to consider because that's the role that we we have chosen to work in. Um, and so you have to look at the radiation testing. Um, you have to look for facilities um, that can provide whatever metrics you need to qualify your material. And those will vary greatly. Um, saying that there is one particular plan to go from step A to step Z for your material is just not realistic. Um, because that may be very different for a non-pressurized molten metal system than it is for a high-pressurized aqueous or water system. Um, so at sort of analyzing and identifying the facilities that you're going to need to perform testing is very important. Um, also, there are the concerns for safety testing. And so, as I mentioned, if you're looking at high pressure, if you're looking at uh, corrosive materials for your coolant, if you're looking at fuels that, um, you know, all, all fuels will evolve over time, but will do so in very unique ways, depending on uh, the constituents of the fuel, the form of the fuel, uh, the arrangement of the fuel within the core structure. Um, and those are all things that need to be considered. And then, of course, there's the system considerations that go along with them. There's testing that uh, needs to be considered for design basis and beyond design basis accident scenarios um, that may not have anything to do with the core. Uh, they may have to do with your steam generation system. They may have to do with your coolant supply. Um, and, and the ability to try and develop those testing uh, techniques and systems can be very challenging. Um, I break this down a little bit uh, as far as operations testing. I'll, I'll delve into each one a little bit. Um, just to show you, not to try and define a, a, a you know, qualification list or something like that, but just to demonstrate the variety of things that need to be considered along the way. Um, a couple of of the graphics that are up here if you're considering looking at say mechanical testing for uh, let's say furnace testing mechanical testing um you know the the scale and size and scope of your materials um, are you looking at say dog bone samples that are you know a, a few inches or, or you know, dozens of centimeters big or are you looking at something that's um part of say a tricep particle which is only about a millimeter in diameter and so you're talking about trying to perform thermomechanical testing on something that needs to be cut out um, very precisely using say like a focused ion um, and again these these have nothing to do with the irradiation or the, the radioactive material yet i mean this is just the performance of the material itself um, so keeping in consideration that there are physical and chemical interactions, the mechanical interactions, high temperature, um, corrosion and erosion, uh, you can see the list that's on the left there. Um, when you get past the stress and strain there, you can develop multiple facilities to be able to do this. And, and by saying that, that means you can go out and procure the equipment. Um, but 
that isn't the only piece of the puzzle that you need to be able to produce the data that is going to help in the qualification process. There needs to be a plan in place to be able to vet within the regulatory concerns to vet the performance of these materials. And that again is going to bring us back to the discussion eventually of quality assurance. Um, and being able to say, you know, here's the data that I produced as, as part of my qualification process. And here's how to a regulator, you can say, this is, this is the data and this is how we present it as part of our design. Um, now the ability to be able to use, um, as I mentioned, multiple, maybe even non-traditional facilities, say at universities or private industry, um, small, you know, smaller companies that, that may be able to do some specialized testing that um, traditionally isn't thought of for, for nuclear industry testing. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of things like thermomechanical performance, chemical performance. There are a lot of pieces of equipment that could be purchased off, you know, from, from vendors and you could set up your own workstation um, to be able to vet your materials. But if you don't have a way to be able to demonstrate to a regulator that there was some thought process behind it, then it may all be moot. Now, when we discuss the radiation testing, um, now, of course, our, our pool of candidates is reduced significantly. Um, there just aren't as many facilities and trying to develop one on your own, even on a small scale is, is well, challenging. Um, that said, there are still capabilities out there without having to go necessarily to a testing reactor so long as you have, again, set up a, a design plan for how whatever facility you're going to use can actually produce the data um, that it is that will help you in your qualification process. And those, that, those are things that are come down to um, the spectrum that you need, the fluence, um, the, the, as I mentioned, the flux density. And so there are facilities that can sort satisfy these, even if they're, say, uh, ion radiation sources, uh, maybe accelerator systems that can aid in at least looking at the DPA that you need for assessing uh, material degradation due to um, uh, irradiation damage. Uh, the facilities may be out there, but as you might imagine, they're also in very high demand. Uh, for instance, the two of the three pictures that are up right now are of the uh, advanced test reactor that's at Idaho National Laboratory. And the idea behind them is that they are pretty well subscribed. Um, even for those trying to perform industrial testing, you might be looking at a year to two years out time before you can actually get into the reactor to do any testing. Um, there's also the development of advanced, um, you know, I should put that in, in quotes because again, the technology has been around for quite some time, uh, but more advanced uh, test facilities. Now, as many of us recognize, the loss of the, the Holden facility in Europe uh, is one that actually can, may cause uh, delays for material testing. Um, but it, at the same time, we're hopefully developing more facilities such as the virtual test reactor that's being developed for the United States for uh, fast electron testing, um, which will not only help, say, reactors or vendors who are developing fast reactors, but also those for thermal spectrum reactors. It's just that it will allow you to be able to accelerate the amount of damage that you're going to impart to your materials. And so, that's again a demonstration of being able to consider uh, the use of one facility for multiple vendors, multiple concepts um, that should hopefully uh, be able to help us when it comes to accelerating our, our time to market, our, our qualification process. As far as safety testing goes, um, again, that kind of takes a, a, a a variety of, of different um, angles. So a couple of the pictures that are up here are of the, uh, the treat facility, the transient reactor test facility uh, that's out here at INL. And, and again, let me mention something I mentioned very early on. Um, 
several of the facilities that I'm showing are those that I'm familiar with, and, and those are the ones that happen to be out here at the Idaho National Lab. Of course, they're not the only facilities that are available. Um, internationally, there are a, a slew of different test reactors um, that are available to do this kind of testing. These are just the ones that I happen to be the most familiar with. Um, testing for, for safety testing, again, can be something that's performed in, in the university setting. Um, maybe not for radiation testing, but if you want to do safety performance for, uh, say, cladding concepts um, that have been thermally treated to, uh, say, off-cycle or, or beyond uh, design uh, temperature ranges, uh, that's, that's an experiment that you can design uh, to be done at a, a industrial uh, laboratory. It can be done in a university. Uh, it, it could be done with a national lab system, say, if you're here in the U.S. or if you're in Europe. Um, but there are a variety of different ways that you can approach that. Um, many times what that comes down to is being able to best um, recreate, I guess, or to best simulate um, a particular accident that or safety concern that you might have for whatever component it is that you're looking at, whether, as I mentioned, whether it's cladding, whether it's fuel performance. Um, now, of course, for the, the case of dealing with something that has to do with uh, a radiation as part of the, the, the safety analysis, then of course you're you're really limiting, uh, and, and by design in many cases, uh, limiting the number of facilities that you have that are available to be able to do this testing. Um, and some that's part of the, again, the world we live in is as being part of the, the nuclear community. Um, but just to know that there are other facilities that could be utilized for doing, say, out-of-pile testing. Um, I introduced this a little bit earlier, and this is one of the, the ideas that I really like to come back to because I, I think it can be incredibly useful, and I know that there are a host of researchers out there who are already attacking this, um, is looking at the importance of scale uh, relative to your testing uh, your materials testing. So if you've got data that is typically used to assess the performance of the material at the bulk level, um, trying to get as much information as you can from as small a sample as you can um, might be a great advantage um, just because you could use a dozen microscopes, uh, electron microscopes to assess a portion of cladding that you have that you put through a single test. Um, and if you only have the ability to analyze them on the bulk scale, then you really only have one device and one sample and that's it. But if you can subdivide that piece of cladding into say a dozen or 20 or 50 pieces, you can then work in parallel on those different pieces and then use the collection of data that you have and then reassemble, if you will, all of that information to tell you something about the performance of the bulk material. Now, this comes into greater uh, importance, in my opinion, when it comes to dealing with radioactive or radiated materials. Um, as I mentioned, the hazard of working with materials that have been irradiated, uh, particularly when it comes to dose for those who are working with it, if there's a way to be able to reduce that, and typically the way to reduce the dose is that if you have you know, a, a sample that is the size of a typical fuel pellet, you know, say maybe one inch tall by half inch in, in diameter, if you could subdivide that into a thousand pieces, that then means that you've reduced the risk for each one of those individual pieces. Now, that doesn't mean that there's none. There are, of course, are radiation concerns for each one of those individual pieces, but now maybe you could work with a small laboratory that has uh, mobile shielding or a small hutch that's used, that's a shielded hutch, as opposed to having to work with everything in a very large hot cell that is typically meant to deal with much larger capacity uh, and much larger dose. Uh, and so if there's uh, a way to be able to do that physically, then that might be a great advantage 
then of course comes the challenge of trying to reconstruct everything. So taking those thousand pieces of data that you have and being able to describe how your one fuel pellet is behaving um, and in different portions of that fuel pellet. Um, that again, beckons the, the idea of having to improve the models that we have as well. So trying to better understand the relationship between the, the micro scale, the microstructural scale, and the, the macro scale or the bulk scale uh, is, is incredibly important in this effort. Um, the image that's shown here is a uh, courtesy of Peter Hoseman at UCAL Berkeley, who's been a pioneer in this field for quite some time um, in trying to look at um, the scale up, if you will, from microstructural analysis up through the bulk property performance. And it's still something that's being developed. And of course, it's something that needs to be vetted for um, each new material that's being considered. But the process itself is something that we can all get behind as far as scientists go, uh, as far as developing the, the technical skills to do it. Um, essentially, what it needs is a large collection of data to support any particular model, whether that's a model for um, fatigue or for creep uh, or, or some other uh, mechanical property. Um, the ability to be able to assimilate all of the, the necessary data to then be able to sort of predict what's going to happen with the performance of your materials is incredibly important. Um, and it's something that could really save on time. Uh, and, and again, saving on time and money as, as your resource that goes along with it. Um, this also allows for a unique uh, opportunity to be able to discuss automation. Um, so in, in the scenario that I threw out there, if you take a fuel pellet and subdivide it into a thousand pieces, um, do you then want to have a thousand people each with their own sample on a thousand different electron microscopes, um, each performing their own set of uh, analyses and then feeding back the data into some large database or something? Or could you establish a system where you are sort of auto feeding your samples into a single device um, that reduces uh, maybe not necessarily the time, but it reduces the, the workload on a, a particular worker. Um, it allows you to be able to do things say uh, 24 hours a day, as opposed to having to rely on the operability of a particular piece of equipment. Um, and then the ability to standardize all of that data collection because now you're using an, an automated system that is on a single device or a single set of devices. Um, it sort of reduces some of the uncertainty that goes along with the data collection as well, which is also very important as part of the process. Uh, in the scenario where you have a thousand different people and a thousand different devices, now you've introduced a thousand different possible sources of uncertainty. Um, beyond the samples themselves, beyond the equipment that they're using. Um, being able to limit the capabilities, um, but expand the use of those capabilities is incredibly valuable. And so the, the strategy would be the ability to, again, to look at something that is something that's a larger scale, say a, mechan a sample for mechanical testing, uh, and being able to walk back through the process, uh, say you start with materials that are not irradiated and they're going to go through their own performance vetting, um, whether that's strength testing um, as one example here. And then you can perform the same testing on an irradiated material and look at comparisons between the two and then start to assess the differences between the performance of non-irradiated versus irradiated at the microstructural scale, and then use that to predict what kind of performance you're going to get at the bulk property or the macroscopic scale. Uh, this is something that, through the use of microscale technology, um, 
you know, the microstructure of using electron microscopes or something in that order. Um, and being able to do multiple sets of samples allows you to build up that database. So instead of saying you've got one fuel pellet that's not been irradiated and one that has, and looking at both properties on one sample per piece, where you would have to use, you know, 20 samples, 50 samples, 100 samples to build up a significant database. Now you could take a particular sample, subdivide it, and then reassemble all that information on the microstructural scale, and then consider what the performance is going to be on the macrostructural or the, uh, or the bulk scale. So the, the key pieces that go into this, again, from my point of view, um, is the ability to be able to have repeatable methods, um, the ability to have some way to correlate them. Um, so whether that's through an existing model or coming up with a premise uh, of, of your own. You know, typically, if you, if you think of a model for the fatigue or, or something like that, that's, that's already well vetted for a material. Um, you can then try and make adaptations to it based on a radiation effects or a thermal mechanical effects, that sort of thing. Um, and then the largest and, and probably most significant portion of this is what I call the large quantity testing, which means the ability to, to get multiple pieces of data um, from a single sample. And if that means through the subdivision of that sample into smaller pieces, or if that means vetting it through multiple testing techniques and then being able to suss out particular pieces of data. Um, the, the important point here is being able to say, I've gotten the most data that I possibly could out of a particular sample. And particularly for, as I mentioned before, for irradiated materials, for those that have uh, radioactive materials that are involved, uh, the more data that we can acquire for the least amount of risk is the most valuable to us. Um, and overall, what this should allow for is the ability to do more testing and then also better testing. Um, as we start to streamline events, again, in the thousand sample to thousand device scenario, um, you know, you could have the inconsistencies of 20 of the devices and then maybe 20 of those pieces of data are now not going to be fed into your database because they have to be thrown out um, for being inconsistent or uh, not reliable or not repeatable. Um, that's where I think the, the greater advantage here of, of looking at a repeatable system is the ability to say that it can also be a vetted or more reliable system. And that again is something that goes towards the quality assurance aspect of, of our process here. Um, there also needs to be some, in, in my opinion, uh, way of reimagining how it is or where uh, we collect uh, information. And I mentioned earlier the Holden facility uh, in Norway that uh, recently shut down. Um, one of the um, one of the tricks of the trade that they were really well known for is adapting their ability to uh, collect information from, say, a, a fuel sample, extracting that fuel sample, and then being able to reconfigure it, uh, uh, re-instrument it and then put it back in pile uh, to do continued testing. And so the, the graphic that's up here is sort of a, a gimmick from, from one of their slides that's in the ability to say that you've got a fuel rod segment that you can then um, re-instrument with, say, in this case, it's a thermocouple and a pressure transducer. You've already got material that's already been irradiated. You then can rig it so that it can then be re-irradiated um, and then taken out and reassessed. And then depending on what the uh, condition of your, your system is, maybe even reconfigure it or re-instrument it again. Um, this is something that's over time, this would allow you to assess performance uh, sort of in situ 
uh, but also the ability to look at time lapse and that for, for fuel performance in particular and, and, and core material performance, that's incredibly valuable. Um, and so there is a, a real present need for similar testing capabilities throughout the world. Um, th there was this uh, need, uh, obviously, before Hull was shut down, uh, but the ability to be able to get these kind of capabilities um, is even more pressing now. Um, there's also the idea in being able to, uh, instead of have one device uh, that you move, say, a, a fuel sample or a material sample from one device to the next, to the next, to the next, is that you can actually configure uh, geometrically, you can configure multiple uh, examination devices uh, to be able to consider a single fuel sample or a material sample and get multiple types and sets of data from one piece of, of uh, material. Um, this is a demonstration of the Meitner project out of IML, um, where they have set up, uh, and I'm going to misrepresent which devices they actually have on here, so I'm not even going to try it. Um, but they actually take a, a material sample, which they place in the, the center of this device, and then they actually have, uh, let's see, it's a, a gamma emission tomography or a gamma emission scope. Um, they have laser flash, I believe, set up for it. But the idea being is that around this um, arrangement, they actually have, oops, sorry, they actually have multiple measuring tools set up to get multiple pieces of information um, from a single piece of material that's here. And I believe one of the points of interest would be to set up multiple, it's, it's I think, gamma uh, emission, which I mentioned, or um, different cameras that are set up to assess material performance, and essentially whether there are cracks or slumping or something like that with a particular material piece, while the material just sits here in the middle. In other words, you don't have to take the piece out from here to go to another device to get, um, you know, to look at porosity and then take that out to again look at uh, grain structure and then take that out to look at you know you can repeat that process as much as you want. It's again trying to leverage as much information at a particular setting as possible. Um, again, to help reduce time, reduce research, to, I guess um, leverage resources and reduce risk. I also mentioned automation as part of this process, and this was a, a gift that I, was borrowed from the University of Liverpool um, in one of their chemistry labs, that they actually set up uh, an autonomous process to be able to go through a set of samples that needed to go through, looks like a gas uh, chromatograph. Um, but point being is that there's really no reason that we couldn't, let's see if I can stop this or not, that you couldn't have, say, these samples being irradiated samples, and they were being sent off to two or three or four different devices that are set up in your laboratory. The laboratory itself would be um, something that's tantamount to a miniature hot cell. Um, but you have multiple pieces that are in there. Where you get the more efficient process going on would be having samples that are, while radioactive, are not so high dose that it would cause system damage. Um, and so you could have something like this robot, if you will, um, to be able to move your samples from one station to the next and be able to collect several pieces of data from these smaller samples. I, I, again, it's it's just a different way to consider um, how to be able to collect this data for, for your materials uh, based on the ability to uh, utilize automation or to reduce dose or um, to try and fit multiple techniques into one. And that's, that's where most of this discussion goes. Let's see if it'll advance the next slide. Okay. Um, 
Another process that goes into this, and this ties into uh, a little bit of automation, a little bit of the micro scale discussion, uh, is the ability to be able to fabricate samples uh, on very small scales. Um, so again, the subdivision of a fuel pellet into a thousand pieces. Um, we'll say that you're working with something that's on a smaller scale than that. I, I mentioned the tricer particle earlier and its dimensions, uh, you know, looking at about a millimeter. Um, and so if you wanted to be able to analyze the, say, inner layer performance of the tricer particle that's been irradiated, um, the idea of that is not new. Um, that's something that's been done for decades now when it comes to analyzing whether particles have failed, uh, where they failed, and trying to even determine how they failed. Um, but when it comes to actually trying to develop samples that are then used for subsequent testing, that's a little bit more of a challenge. Um, irradiation concerns aside, when you're trying to work with materials that are, are already on the uh, milli scale, if you will, and then you're going to have samples that are on the micro scale, trying to do that in any sort of repeatable fashion has been a challenge. But that's something that would be a great advantage is if you could have, say, a, a line or a stack of, of tricer particles, and you had a fib configured, a focused on being configured to be able to cut out samples from each one of those particles, which then you could take each one of those samples to be able to be tested through an automated system. Uh, say they all have to be scanned in an SEM, uh, or they all have to go uh, undergo tensile testing. Um, those are the sorts of things that could possibly be automated, but it takes some, some time to develop the techniques um, in order to make it a more efficient process. But these types of processes have been widely used in automotive and medical industries for, for quite some time, for decades now. And it's something that on a larger scale, we should really consider um, you know, you may have one university or one vendor or a, a couple of vendors that are working together on this. But if we as an industry as a whole start to focus in on how to be able to leverage these different technologies, I, I think it benefits us all. Um, this is just another demonstration of the idea of reducing sample size, which then, uh, especially for radiated materials, which then allows you to be able to reduce um, once you reduce the dose, reduce the hazard, now you can look at being more uh, modular, shall we say, or, or, or inventive when it comes to being able to access materials. So the, the, the gift that I showed a, a couple of slides back with the robot that was working amongst two different uh, sides of the laboratory. Well, imagine if you had a room that had, say, um, sorry about that. Say you had a room that was set up with multiple shielding walls or these, these sort of moving uh, lead shielded walls that were different places that were kind of shielding a particular device. Um, and the robot was able to go through and say, put a cartridge of samples into an SEM. And then the shielding was placed in front of the SEM to reduce the amount of dose that might be coming away from it, which then would save uh, the ability, say, for even uh, human access if this were a large enough facility and not a nerd or something like that, um, or reduce the dose that would be imparted to that particular robot that was doing the automation portion. Uh, but the idea that you could have these multiple stations in one laboratory setting and not have it have to be a monolithic hot cell. It could be something that looks like much more like a, a typical uh, university laboratory or something along those lines. Um, it's just trying to think about things in a little different way and, and trying to get perspective on how we can use technologies that already exist um, to make the process go a little faster and a little better. Um, I've mentioned this now in, in a couple of places, and, and this is purely an editorial because I, I think it's something that, uh, admittedly, even for myself, is not something I put a lot of consideration into until, say, the past 10 years or so is the ability to justify the uh, processes that you went through to produce the data that is being used as part of your process for qualification. Um, 
developing a, a facility that's got NQA1 uh, compliant research programs, uh, uh, nuclear quality assurance uh, designation one. Um, there are very few facilities that are out there, but um, they do exist. Uh, actually, there, there are several that are available in industry uh, when it comes to, say, steel manufacturing or, um, say, materials uh, for reactor use, particularly those that are, I'll say, X core. Um, for in core and subsequent material development, um, and especially at the university level. I, I and of course I, I again say this with great bias because I've been in academia for quite some time. Um, the ability to dare I say the word prove, but I'll put that in air quotes, um, prove that the university system is is able to be able to produce the kind of data that is relevant for qualification of materials is a very important thing. And I, I think a, a resource that's really can be tapped into um, with some efforts, but I think can be done so in a relatively short order. And it can really boost uh, the development of our materials program um, for, for nuclear materials. And so I, I implore anyone who has any interest in, in sort of jumping into the field of materials analysis um, and even the automation process of this, um, should consider going through the qualification um, process. Uh, that's probably not the right way to put it. Um, to at least investigate what it would be for you to set up a compliant research program. Um, and there are, there are universities, I know uh, here in the US and, and abroad that actually have done this. It's not a large number, it's, it's a very small number, but they do exist. Um, and so and anyway, that's that's something that I think would be a, a great advantage to any entity, um, vendor, university, laboratory alike, uh, to be able to help. That, that just sort of reinforces um, the processes, the justification of the processes that are used in the data that you've collected. And, and to be honest, it, it really helps to save uh, I don't want to say on scrutiny because there's scrutiny, of course, it needs to be placed on the work that we do. Um, but it provides, to borrow from the term, a little bit of assurance that you as an entity have taken the time to be able to assess what it is that your team can do, what your program can do, and sort of provide a demonstration that you have the ability to collect valid data that is part of the qualification program. So how do you get started? Um, I've mentioned a, a lot of different names um, throughout this process, a lot of different avenues that can be uh, traveled to be able to, to go down this path. Um, really, it's identifying facilities that I think is, is very important. And there are some uh, names that are up here particularly. I, I mentioned this for uh, you know, the US um, contingents will be much more familiar with these, but at least um, lets international collaborators know that you, you may have very similar systems set up, uh, whether that's through uh, CEA in France, um, whether that's through uh, CARI or through KAIST um, in South Korea. Um, in the U.S., we have a, a set of partner facilities that are set up that include national lab, uh, industry, and universities um, through the nuclear science user facilities um, opportunity. There's also opportunities for uh, vendors and um, um, reactor development teams uh, to be able to access facilities, mostly at the national lab scale or the vendor scale. Um, through the GAIN initiative, which was recently established through Idaho National Laboratory. Um, and then to really mention that there's a, a host of collaborators that are available who have very um, impressive facilities at the university level and industrial collaborators. Um, if one were to consider partnerships with, say, um, whether it's uh, 
Chromatome or whether it's GE, uh, whether it's Orano, um, whether it's with the, um, say the, the partners from the national labs, whether in the US or abroad, um, there are a lot of different opportunities that are out there. A lot of people who are interested in doing this work um, is really just trying to make more of a collective effort to identify who has the capabilities and the, uh, the usefulness in their abilities to be able to do this work. So um, as a summary, um, as I mentioned very early on, there's, there's a, a variety of reactor types that are being developed, um, which really is a blessing for the nuclear community. Um, there doesn't seem to be any shortage of good ideas that are out there and they should all be explored. But, <laughs> and this is the but, um, it does put a strain on the available resources for assessment, uh, for radiation and safety testing, and overall for the qualification uh, process. Um, that's not to say that's not a challenge worth tackling, um, but it is a, a challenge that needs to be addressed. Uh, and so this needs to drive innovative thinking on how to assess materials for new reactor types, and not only the processes that you go through, but how the different pieces of data can be assembled into a single qualification package. Uh, and the collaborators who are available to be able to help out as part of the process. And with that, I want to take a moment to put a blatant advertisement out here. Um, so I am employed by Idaho State University. I've been here as an assistant professor for just over a year uh, after spending five years here as a student. Um, I also want to mention that along with our main campus, which is in Pocatello, Idaho, we actually have a satellite campus, which is, as you can see from this picture, these are cars that are in the parking lot. So it's probably about oh, 100 yards from some of our classrooms to the INL facilities that are here in Idaho Falls. Um, so for those of you who may be coming to visit Idaho National Lab at some particular time, uh, feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to meet with you. And with that, I thank you for your time and open up the floor to any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Breer, Dr. LeBreer. Um, while questions are coming in, we'll just take a quick look at the upcoming webinar presentations that we have on schedule. In June, a comparison of 16 reactors, neutronic performance closed, enclosed thorium, uranium, and uranium plutonium cycles. In July, a presentation, um, an overview of small modular reactor technology development. And in August, overview and status update on molten salt reactor technology development in the US. So Dr. Labrea, there is one question um, so far in the in the Q&A pane. Um, it reads, would you suggest an equipment testing roadmap for liquid fuel reactors, such as the molten salt reactor materials? Do you have any reference sources? Um, so that's, that is a very good question. Um, let me we'll read the question a little bit more in detail. Um, I would say in particular for roadmaps for technology development for molten salt reactors. Um, your first resource, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned, would likely be Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, they have been one of the, and continue to be one of the pioneers in the field of MSR research. So if you're looking um, for a, a testing roadmap, they, I, I, I can't think of one off the top of my head but that's not to say they don't have one already. And especially with the resources they've started to reinvest on molten salt reactor technology. I, I actually wouldn't be surprised if they have one already published or um, at least have one in development. So that, that would be my first resource. Um, there's also, uh, if memory serves me right, a uh, conglomerate page for molten salt technical background research called molten salt.org. 
ORG, I think is what it is. Um, and they have a, a pretty broad collection of, of different activities that have been done. You can actually access these through the, the GAIN website, the, the GAIN initiative that I referred to a, a few slides ago. And that's kept up by Idaho National Lab. Um, so that's GAIN, which is G-A-I-N dot I-N-L dot G-O-V. And then there are references for actually all sorts of uh, advanced reactor technologies that you could use as a reference. So that that would also be a good place to, to follow up. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question reads, Professor said the development and qualification of nuclear material needs very long period, around 30 years. How do you young middle researchers have dreams or make careers up for this target? I don't know if you have words of inspiration there. Um, the first thing I can say is even though I'm in my first, finishing up my first full year as an assistant professor, I'm not that young. Um, secondly, let me clarify, for fuel qualification, you're usually looking at 20 to 25 years. Um, in some material cases, you could get by, uh, as I mentioned, with alloy 617, that's more on the long lines of maybe 15 years, but, but you're right, it can be a very laborious and timely process. Um, I think, I, okay, again, only my opinion. Um, sometimes you have to look at a variety of different materials and sort of assess for yourself where you think your time is best suited for attacking a, a particular material, I guess. Um, and that just comes out of communication. It, it, it really does. Um, I just, I enjoy the way this is put in. Uh, young middle researchers who have dreams or, or make careers. Um, and, and you really can do that. If, if, if there's enough follow through in the industry, you really can make a career out of just a, uh, I'll say, a assessment of a simple material. Um, but that said, again, my strategy is one more right. I like to at least assess as we go what materials are being uh, researched. And then from there, if you need to pivot to looking at more, I, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'll give you 30 seconds of my background on this. Um, I actually started off looking at actinide recovery for power processing. So looking at an oxide to metal conversion uh, in molten salt research. Then switch to materials research for graphite. Uh, then moved into structural materials, particularly steels, for advanced uh, light water technology. And I'm now starting to revert back to technologies related to graphite for molten salts and for novel metals for liquid metal, uh, particularly sodium reactors. So you may cycle back upon uh, a type of research that you've done in the past. So it's, in my opinion, it's a good idea to kind of keep your eyes open for uh, different materials and sort of just kind of see how, uh, how the funding is going, how the, the industrial interest is going, um, and that may steer you to what particular area you're going to search for your career with the consideration that that may change in five years um, or 10 years. It's That's just kind of the nature of the our, our industry as it is. It, it, it can often go through cycles where there's interest in and and by interest, I mean financial, um, financial interest versus times where we're a little more lean as far as our research resources go. So thank you. All right, thank you. Does a catalog of test facilities exist with the specific testing capabilities identified, you know, for example, size constraints on samples? 
the first resource I will send to you for that is through the, the nuclear science user facilities, at least for the US. Um, and so that is nsuf.inl.gov. Um, they actually do have a database of facilities and equipment within those facilities that can be used for your research. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's part of a process where you, you essentially apply for time uh, to be able to use those resources. But that said, the, the database, um, I think you just need to be able to create an account um, on that website. And it, it's been a few years since I did so myself, but I, I think that's the process. Um, that would be the first place that I would steer you to. Thank you. What are the advancements in cloud material related to hydrogen management during severe accidents for the Gen 3 plus water cooled reactors <clears throat> when it will be introduced into the commercial reactors? Um, that's a really good question that I don't have a clear answer to. Um, I know that I know several folks who are looking at hydrogen management for uh, advanced cladding techniques, specifically here in Idaho at, at Idaho National Lab and at Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, I would direct you to their research as far as where the technology is, as far as implementation into, say, reactor testing, that is a little outside my uh, my comfort zone, a little bit outside my ability to, to provide a, a a really good answer for you. So I apologize for that. Thank no, you. thank you. What are your opinions on a surveillance campaign to monitor materials in inside a demonstration or prototype reactor to mitigate any un excuse me to mitigate any uncertainties that aren't covered by testing? I is that a question in the oh okay I see now I'm I'm scrolling down a little bit I can actually see the the questions that come. Yeah, it's easier to read them yourself. Yes, yeah, that's, that, that's okay. Um, well, I, I would have to say my first and overall opinion is it's a good thing. Um, if, if you can develop it properly, that's the uh, that's the greater challenge is, is accountability for, uh, especially for, for nuclear materials, especially nuclear materials is, how you're going to um, how you're going to go about a surveillance campaign? So th this kind of brings back the idea of establishing a roadmap for for your processes. Um, my limited experience when it comes to surveillance is actually on the on the back end of the fuel cycle, not the front end. Um, again, sort of related to to viral processing and. In their particular case, it would have been surveillance for inventory of plutonium. Um, and that was a, one of the greatest challenges is overcoming the uncertainty that goes along with the monitoring system that you have in place. Um, I think the, the best approach, and again, you asked for my opinion, so <laughs> um, the best approach is to lay out your process, literally write out steps A, B, C through Z and, and see where your, your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and try and address the weaknesses as best you can. Um, also, and, and inside a demonstration prototype reaction, you know, again, uncertainties. So uh, another consideration might be, as you mentioned, trying to set up a, a campaign for a, a prototype reactor is that, as I mentioned earlier, and this is no deference to the people doing uh, the, the work now, but the most of the research that's being done now for advanced reactors is not new in principle. Um, and so there may be historical information that's out there for, um, Say, for example, a high temperature gas core reactor. Um, there's existing data out there for the past 40, 50 years that you may be able to 
review and leverage towards developing a strategy for for doing such a surveillance campaign. I I, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a hierarchy for testing priority? For example, testing supporting existing fleet of LWRs, for example, for ATF takes priority over testing supporting a speculative advanced reactor, or is the hierarchy simply who can pay for the testing? Um, that's a good question. That's about 12 steps over my pay grade. Um, <laughs> the, the, the short answer is I, I don't really know. Um, what the, the hierarchy is, because I, I honestly think that if you, there's two aspects to it. One is what is the current emphasis on um, reactor fleet development from a funding standpoint? Um, and that is also tied into the political aspect of it as well. Um, so that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece is that if you ask 10 different people what their opinions are that you will likely get 10 different answers um and in my position i really can't say one versus the other this is one of the uh difficulties in trying to sort of push forward any single reactor technology, at least here in the US, is that pretty much anything is open game, um, which means that if you've got a novel concept for fuel development for sodium fast reactor, that if you can demonstrate its viability well enough, maybe it can overtake something that has a little more established technology um, but again, as far as the actual um, hierarchy of it, that is, that's a really complicated question that I can't answer with any direct certainty. So sorry about that, but thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna go, um, the same person has a series of about three more questions. So I'm gonna just read them and post all three and then you can give overarching thoughts perhaps. How about that? Okay, um, another option might be if, if this person wouldn't mind, they could actually reach out to me online, well, offline, I guess, through my, uh, my email address, which is listed at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and we might be able to have a, a little more dialogue about this um, offline if that's more constructive. Excellent point, thank you. What level of sharing of testing results exists? Is it dependent on the level of subsidizing of the tests? Who ensures testing is not duplicative prior to tests performed by others for the limited availability of the test facilities? And lastly, do you have an, an example of predicted behavior by a computational model that was not representative of measured behavior? So for the first two, actually, I'm going to answer the third one first. And the easiest way that I can answer that is off the top of my head, no, I don't have an example. <laughs> um, I, but then again, I, I wonder if that is directed more towards looking at the microstructural, the macrostructural uh, behavior. And that's still something that's under development. Um, so the idea, it, it, in other words, we can't just make assumptions about what's happening at the microstructural level and assume that that sort of propagates towards macrostructural behavior. Um, that was more the point I was trying to get across is, uh, again, from my point of view, you, you can't make that jump without having the, both the, the physical data and the correlations to be able to, to tie them together. For the, First two questions, uh, level of sharing of testing results, that is dependent on many factors, to be very honest. Um, I, I, I'm not really sure where I can even start with that question. Um, but that one and the second one, uh, when insurance testing is not duplicative of prior tests performed. Um, 
many times the the actual testing facility itself will or the whoever manages that site um there's a lot of time that's put into researching what what's been done historically um so that there is not a a lot of duplication but i will also put out there that in some cases duplication can be a, a good thing from the aspect of trying to verify results and that's even true for historical testing um, for say molten salt um, technologies if there's a particular alloy you're trying to vet that was last researched let's say in the 1990s um, you may want to actually redo an experiment um, that that was done on that particular alloy. Um, I, another example I'll give is when they restarted the treat facility, the transient reactor testing facility at Idaho National Lab. Um, they first brought it back up in November 2017, so early 2018. Um, as they were going through their operations testing, some of their early tests, and, and granted these were more operations driven than uh, I'll say experimental results driven, um, actually work as best as they could reproductions of experiments that were done shortly before the reactor was shut down. Uh, and that was really to get a, a sense of what kind of condition the, the operability of the reactor was. Um, so it's it, that's a very complicated question, or I should say the answer is very complicated, is that some of the impetus is on the researcher to make sure that the work that has been done that you're proposing to do hasn't already been done or does it need some uh, secondary or tertiary vetting which means that you could sort of recreate or nearly duplicate a, an experiment that's been done um, there's also the consideration that um, and this is something that I've only found through experience is that many times you'll have, and I have had this actually happen to me a few times, um, where I thought I had a good idea for an experiment and walked my way through the process until I got talking to the right person at the right facility who said, yeah, that information is going to be published in six months. Um, is there anything else that you want to look at? And sometimes there's no good way to know that ahead of time. Um, especially for for our industry, which seems to be very cutting edge as far as testing goes, in that, and you know, sometimes getting going from test development through test implementation to data analysis may be a you know a multi year process. Uh, it may take you two to three years just to develop the test, and then another year to schedule it, and then you know, another six months to a year to actually process the data. I mean, you're, you could be looking at a five year window from the time you broach the subject to somebody to the time that you actually are ready to publish. And that's from an academic point of view, that's very difficult to try and lay out ahead of time. Um, uh, it's probably not the answer you were looking for, but uh, in reality, that's sort of what the answer is. So thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a person who wanted to ask, what are the operation conditions of irradiation and post-irradiation experiments? Also, what information do we acquire from these experiments in general? That's a really long answer um, because it, it can be all over the map. Um, you know, operation conditions of irradiation well, what technology are you looking at? Um, typically, you want to try and mimic any experiment that you're going to put together. You want to try and mimic your actual operating scenario as as closely as you can with regards to material choice, temperature, working fluid, uh, thermal hydraulics of the system, that sort of thing. Um, so that that will vary from one test to the next. Um, depending on what it is that you're interested in studying. 
Uh, for PIE, post radiation examination, that really just kind of depends on what information are you you're looking for. Uh, if you're interested in, you know, as this topic suggests, um, assessment for materials, you know, if you've got a metal versus a ceramic versus an oxide versus, um, I'm trying to think of what else. Um, those will usually just depend on what instrument you're going to be using. Um, is well, and the I'll say the conditions to which your test material was subjected. So, for instance, if you had a material that was vetted in a sodium uh, sodium cooled loop, so it was exposed to sodium along the way, um, that will need to be treated with probably a little different mechanism than it would be if you had say a, a steel that was irradiated in, in an inert environment um that in other words you know one could interact with air eventually and the other would need some treatment before doing so um what information do we acquire from these experiments in general that is the subject of several classes uh, at the university level. Uh, most introductory material science classes would allow you to be able to consider the, uh, the physical, uh, the mechanical, and the chemical <clears throat> um, properties for whatever material it is that you're looking for. And again, depending on what type of material it is and what state it's in, uh, the, those answers can very, uh, have, have a lot of variety to them. So thank you. thank you. Are material test results generally kept as IP, particularly with the number of private companies developing fuels and reactors? I suppose IP would be um, yeah, proprietary. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how to answer that as generally because that's going to depend. Um, there are there are plenty of materials that are vetted internally, but again, my opinion, um, internally vetted by companies for their own use that the results may not be released. But on the other hand, there there are a slew of information that's been put out there in recent years for uh, advanced material and advanced fuel materials um, that, you know, if, if it's in the open publication, then that suggests that it's not subject to the IP, at least that portion of it isn't restricted to the IP um, conditions. That, that, again, is one that goes with an asterisk along with the answer under it depends. Um, there may be information that's allowed to be shared publicly and some that's not. And that will vary by technology, by group, by company. Uh, but, but there are a lot of variables that are involved. So thank you. Thank you. I know we're running just a little bit long today, but there are, there are two more questions um, so that we don't leave anybody out. The, the second to last is the uh, regarding the current design codes. Are the current design codes suitable for Gen 4, or do we need to develop new ones, um, which could add a number of years out to timelines? Mm, that is a question that is better suited for the regulatory body of whichever country you happen to be in. So the US, that would be the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, as I understand it, and, and you can find this publicly on their website, um, there's been a lot of um, emphasis in the past few years for getting the regulatory body to sort of catch up to the designs that are being put forth for advanced reactors. Um, and so there may be evaluation that is based on a particular design keeping in mind the design codes from, from previous generations. Um, I would actually direct you to one example that's being evaluated right now by the NRC, and that is the 
uh, advanced reactor company called Oklo. It's O-K-L-O. Um, they recently submitted paperwork for evaluation to the uh, US NRC, and it's publicly available on, on the NRC website. Um, to get an idea of what the, I don't want to say the new normal will be, but at least a, a new process consideration on being able to uh, qualify designs for, for advanced reactors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then if we have ongoing questions after this last one, we can we can you can email those to directly um, to Dr. Labrier, or if you want to email them to me, um, I can compile them and make sure that we get written responses and we can post those along with the slide deck on the GIF uh, webinar page with the recording of today's presentation so that everyone can share the information. Um, so last, the last question we'll take today, and again, I appreciate everybody for hanging in there. We don't usually go this long. We're, we're rapidly approaching two hour mark, so I can't believe the level of interest. It's fantastic. How do you take the corrosion and erosion of materials into consideration while modeling the service life of an advanced reactor? Um, that is a really, that's a really good question. Um, I'll say from a, because there's a couple of different ways you can approach this, from a baseline level, um, I'd say if you're going to, you know, <laughs> the short answer is we're trying to figure that out. Um, the, the longer answer is um, you need the experiments to sort of supplement the, the modeling that goes along with it. So, so say for instance, if you all take a, publicly available set of codes through, um, through I know whether it's well, it, you could say through like a material performance code like Bison, which is developed by INL for, for thermomechanical properties of materials. Um, there are models that are established based off of historical data and being um, augmented based on recent data. For, um, for interactions with properties. And, and that has to do with very complicated systems for uh, either for corrosion or for um, uh, say embrittlement, uh, radiation damage, a, a whole cluster of very different um, agitators to the material. For the modeling that comes down to physically which of the mechanisms are more dominant and at which stages. And that, in my opinion, comes down to a combination of separate and integral effects testing. Um, so you would need to do, and, and again, I, I make no bones about it, I'm an experimentalist by heart. Um, that means you're gonna be doing testing in your prototypical environment uh, from a physical and chemical standpoint to observe corrosion as it may happen through a, obviously a shortened lifetime. Um, and then you would have to consider the radiation effects. And then if you can start to integrate these into multiple factors occurring at the same time, then you see how your material performs through say microscopy or something like that or um, <clears throat> adjustments in your your structural, um, any structural changes that you might have at say the microstructural level. <clears throat> Pardon me, I kind of ran out of water. Um, so <laughs> my throat's a little dry. Um, but the last, uh, the last thing I'd say on that is that it's, it's, it's a very complicated question that I think researchers are still kind of plowing through. And, and I realize I've said that now probably for every question that's involved. Um, these are all very good questions. They're also very multifaceted, multi-component, complicated questions. Um, and that's why it's really encouraging to see as many folks that have been on here uh, today that, that are interested in this because we need you and your friends and your colleagues and to kind of jump on board to, to help with this. Um, 
So I, I think that's where I'm going to step off and, and say thanks to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Labrere. You, I, it takes a bit of time, I know, to, to put these presentations together, and we really appreciate you sharing um, your time and your expertise with us. No problem at all. Um, and thank you to uh, to the Gen 4 International Forum for the opportunity. This is uh, this has really been fun. So so thank you again. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bertha. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.